Matilda. It's a funny thing about mothers and fathers. Even when their own child is the most disgusting little blister you could ever imagine, they still think that he or she is wonderful. But occasionally one comes across parents who take the opposite line, who show no interest at all in their children. And these, of course, are far worse than the doting ones. Mr and Mrs Wormwood were two such parents. Matilda! Matilda! Where is she? The little bunion. Oh, search me, Harry. Probably got a nose and a stupid book. What good will that do her? She's a scab, that's what she is. A scab. Matilda! Matilda! Looking back on it all, it seems a very strange story indeed. But every bit of it is true. My parents, my brother Michael and I, lived in quite a nice house with three bedrooms. My father was a dealer in second-hand cars. I was only five when I discovered just how he earned all his money. But it's a day that I've never forgotten. Sawdust. Sawdust, Mike, my lad, is one of the great secrets of my success. Sawdust? I'll thank you for not interrupting, Matilda. This is between me and Mike, innit, Mike? Yeah. Sawdust. Now, you need to know about it, since you'll be joining me in the business one day, won't you, son? Yeah. Of course you will. Well, sawdust costs me absolutely nothing. Get it free from the sawmill. I don't see how sawdust can help you to sell second-hand cars, Daddy. That's because you, Matilda, are an ignorant little twit. Now, button up, will ya? I'm talking to your brother, ain't I, son? Yeah. See ya. I'm always glad to buy a car when some fool has been crashing the gears so badly they're all worn out and rattle like mad. Do you know why I'm glad to buy that sort of car, son? No. Well, I'll tell you. Because I get it cheap, that's why. Then all I do is mix a lot of sawdust with the oil in the gearbox and it runs as sweet as a nut. How long will it run like that before it starts rattling again? Long enough for the buyer to get a good distance away. But that's dishonest, Daddy. It's cheating. No one ever got rich by being honest. Customers are there to be diddled. That's what customers is for, isn't it, my son? Yeah. Take mileage, for instance. Anyone who's buying a second-hand car, the first thing he wants to know is how many miles it's done, right? Yeah. So I buy an old dump that's got about 150,000 miles on the clock. I get it cheap, but no-one's going to buy it with a mileage like that, are they? No. So what do I do? I use my brains, laddie. That's what I do. Oh. The speedometer, see, is run off a cable that's coupled up to one of the front wheels. So, first I disconnect the cable where it joins the front wheel. Next, I get one of those high-speed electric drills and I couple that up to the end of the cable in such a way that when the drill turns, it turns the cable backwards, right? Right. So, when I switch on the drill, the mileage numbers on the speedo spin backwards at a terrific rate. Wow, that's fantastic, Dad. Brain, son. When you've been given a fine brain like I have, you have to use it. Right. I'm telling you trade secrets. So don't you go talking about this to anyone else. You don't want me put in jug, do you? Here, yeah. do you do this to many cars, Dad? Every single car that comes through my hands gets the treatment. But that's even more dishonest than the sawdust, Daddy. It's disgusting. You're cheating people. If you don't like it, then don't eat the food in this ass. It's bought with the profits. It's dirty money. I hate it. Who the heck do you think you are? The Archbishop of Canterbury or something. Burger and fries all round. Here's your mother with your TV dinner, which of course you don't deserve. Tell your mother what you just said. Go on, tell her. Well, what was it you said, Matilda? I said that the money Daddy makes out of cheating people is dirty money. Oh! Yeah. Who the heck do you think you are? An ignorant little squirt who hasn't the foggiest idea what she's talking about. Quite right, Harry. You tell me about it. You've got a nerve talking to your father like that. Quite right. Now keep your nasty mouth shut so we can all watch this programme in peace. Please! <laughs> Why do you keep looking over there? No reason, really. You always hear it. Mummy? Oh, what now? Would you mind if I ate my supper in the dining room so I could read my book? Oh, for pity's sake. I would mind. Supper is a family gathering and no-one leaves the table till it's over. But we're not at the table. We never are. 
We're always eating off our knees and watching telly. What's wrong with watching telly, may I ask? You get more from watching telly than reading stupid books. Yes. Turn it up, Michael. I didn't enjoy being told I was stupid all the time. And what's more, I wished my family would read a little Charles Dickens or Rudyard Kipling. Then they'd soon discover there was more to life than cheating people and watching television. I was determined to get my own back, starting the next day with my father, his pork pie hat and a tube of superglue. What's the matter? You had a bad day? Bad day? I should say I have. I can't get my hat off. Oh, don't be daft. I am not being daft. Mm. I can't get my blooming hat off, oh, I tell you. Sake. I've had to wear it all day feeling like a complete oh. idiot. Oh, come here. Let me try. Oh, God! Oh, don't don't, don't do that. You take half the skin off me for it. Oh, for heaven's sake. Whatever's the matter, Daddy? Has your head suddenly swollen or something? Don't you look over the top of your wretched book at me like that, Matilda Wormwood. I don't trust you. It must be super glue. What sort of glue? That'll teach you to go playing around with nasty stuff like I that. I wasn't. I expect you was trying to sit another feather in your hat. I haven't touched the flaming stuff. You should read the label on the tube before you start messing with dangerous products. Why in heaven's name are you talking about, you stupid witch? Oh. There's a boy down the road who got some super glue on his finger without knowing it, and then he put his finger to his nose. Oh, yeah? So what happened to him? The finger got stuck inside his nose for a whole week, and people kept saying to him, Stop picking your nose! Oh, serves him right. He shouldn't have put his finger up there in the first place. Filthy habit. Grown-ups do it too, Mummy. I saw you doing it yesterday in the oh, kitchen. That's quite enough from you! Yes, be quiet. What's for tea? <sighs> put the telly on, Michael. I can't have my shower. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, oh dear, I've never. <laughs> and what exactly is the matter? Oh, I've never seen such a funny sight. Skinny little you, skulking around in your purple striped pyjamas with your hat on. Well, thank you for your sympathy. <laughs> oh, come on. See the funny side? You've got to admit, looking like that, you're hardly the kind of man a wife dreams about. Well, I can't help it, can I? Oh, come on, Harry. Settle down. Stop fussing. I expect it'll be loose by the morning and it'll slip off easily. Oh, yeah? If not, then I'll have to take the scissors to it. You what? Come on, get some sleep. Well, well it's all really well for you. Ha! Huh. Proper turn up for the books, this is. It's still stuck. What? Where? It still oh. won't come off. Oh. What else going on? What, what, what's the matter? It's still stuck, I tell you. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. oh, for heaven's sake. I thought World War Three had started. Hold still and I'll get the scissors. I don't know that that's such a good idea. Here we are. Steady. Steady. Oh. Ouch! Oh, God, careful what you're Hang doing, woman. on. Well, I've done the top. Now for the brim. Ah. I'm going to have to chop the hair a bit round the sides. Oh, oh blimey, watch out! I can't help it. I've got to chop great handfuls of hair off. It's the only way. I'll be a laughing stock. Oh, here we go. Done. Ah! There's a big bald rim all round me head. <laughs> It'll grow. I look like a monk. Well, I had to cut the hair where the glue was, I'll tell you. But what about these patches of stuff on me forehead? That was where the glue was stuck straight onto your skin. But it's disgusting. It's all brown and leathery. It'll wear off. Oh, come on, have some breakfast. Take your mind off it. <laughs> Daddy, 
Daddy? Pass the milk, Michael. Daddy? More toast, Harry? Don't mind if I do. Daddy? What? You must try and get those little bits off your forehead. I know. I know. I'm not stupid. It's just that it looks, well, as though you've got little brown insects crawling about all over you. Oh. Eat your <laughs> breakfast. People will think you've got lice. Be quiet. Lice. Just keep your nasty mouth shut, will ya? Of course, I longed for my parents to be loving and understanding. But I just had to put up with the fact that they were not. After the hat episode, my father was less cocky and unbearable for several days. But it wasn't long before there was another flare-up. I'm home! Hello! I'm in the kitchen! Oh, I'm coming to get you! <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 nice new suit, Harry. Oh, darn. Right, the yellow and brown checks. You must have had a good day. Couldn't have been better. I say. Couldn't have been better, I tell you. We're a lot richer tonight than we was this morning. Oh, that's what I like to hear. Your husband has sold no less than five cars. Five? Each one at a tidy profit. Harry, you're a marvel. Oh. Did you hear this, Michael? Five cars, each a tidy profit. Yeah. Sawdust in the gearboxes, the electric drill on the speedometer cables, a splash of paint here and there, and a few <laughs> other clever little tricks, and idiots were all falling <laughs> over themselves to buy. Of course they were. <laughs> oh, I tell you what. What? We need to celebrate. How's about I nip out and get fish and chips? That's my goal. <laughs> Won't be long. Now then, Mike, my son. Listen to your clever old dad. Matilda, mm -hmm. pass him that pad and pencil from off the side there. Come on, buck up. Here you are. Right. Now, seeing as you'll be going into the business with me one day, you've got to know how to add up the profits you make at the end of each day, right? Yeah. When you're in big business like I am, you've got to be hot stuff at arithmetic. So, write down these figures. Car number one was bought by me for £278 and sold for £1,425. Got that? Yeah. Car number two cost me £118 and sold for £760. Right? Yeah. Car number three cost £111 and sold for £999.50. How much? £999.50. Cool! Look, never ask for a big round figure. Always go just below it. It sounds much less, but it isn't. <laughs> Clever, eh? You're brilliant, Dad. Well, car number four cost £86, a real wreck that was, and sold for £699.50. Six hundred and ninety-nine pounds. Fifty. Fifty. Car number five cost six hundred and thirty-seven pounds, and I sold it for sixteen hundred and forty-nine fifty. Got it? I think so. Right, son. Now, work out the profit I made on each car and add up the total. Then you'll be able to tell me how much money your brilliant father made altogether today. That's a lot of sums. Of course it is. But it took me less than ten minutes to work the whole thing out. You mean you did it in your head? Well, not exactly. Nobody could do that. Dad? Don't butt in, Matilda. You made exactly £4,303.50 altogether. I said don't butt in. Your brother and I are busy with eye finance. But, Dad... Shut up! Stop guessing and trying to be clever. Look at your answer, Dad. If you've done it right, it ought to be £4,303.50. Is that what you've got? Say that again. £4,303.50. I'm sure it's right. You little cheat! <gasps> you looked at my piece of paper! No! You read it off from what I got written here! Daddy, I'm the other side of the room. How could I possibly see it? Don't give me that rubbish. Of course you looked. I did You must have looked. No! No one in the world could get the right answer like that, especially a girl. <gasps> You're a little cheat, madam. That's what I'm you not. are. You're a cheat and a liar. I'm not. Rounds. Oh, 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 Harry, you've gone all red in the face. Whatever's the matter? Your daughter is a cheat and a liar. I'm not. I promise I'm not. Not another word out of you. Do as your father says, Matilda. Shut up. Michael, turn the telly on and let's not have any more talk.
There was no doubt in my mind that this deserved more punishment, and my brain went to work on various possibilities. Soon I had a plan. It involved my mother's platinum blonde hair dye extra strong, which she kept on one shelf in the bathroom, and my father's oil of violets hair tonic, which he kept on another shelf, and which he massaged into his scalp every morning, making great grunting noises as he did so. Oh, oh, get um, yo, oh yeah, cool, that's a ticket. Oh, 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 rub it right into oh, into the room, oh, into the room. Oh, it's lovely, lovely. Oh. Harry, one more squirt. Oh, oh, that's the job. Oh. Oh, good strong air that means there's a good strong brain under me. Harry, your breakfast's nearly ready. I'm just doing my oil of violets. I won't be a teak. Oh, God. Oh, oil. Oh, oh. Matilda. Harry, your eggs are done. Coming. Pass your brother the peanut butter, Matilda. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Here comes the master of the house. Good morning, all. And where's my sausage, egg and bacon? Just getting it out the pan, treasure. Here it is. Oh! Oh! What the heck's the matter? You've just dropped me breakfast, woman. Go look oh! at a mess you made. Bum, 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 bum. What have you... What on earth is it? You look as though you've seen a ghost. What? What are you talking about? What do you mean, what have I done? Whatever have I done? Whatever have you done to... To what? To what? To your hair! To my hair? Oh, my God, Dad. Never seen nothing like it. I ain't it. done nothing to it. You died it. It looks horrendous. Hey? Why did you do it, you fool? You what? You look like a freak. What the blazes are you talking about? You look weird, Dad. Your beautiful black hair. Your beautiful black... Is this some stupid joke? No, Dad, you must have dyed it. It's the same colour as Mum's, only much dirtier looking. Of course he dyed it. No, I haven't. He can't change colour all by itself. I know that. What on earth were you trying to do? Make uh, yourself look handsome or something? Look... You look like somebody's grandmother gone wrong. Give me a mirror. Don't just stand here shrieking oh. at me. Get me a mirror. Get my powder comp out of my bag, Matilda. Just there on the side. Oh, the world's gone absolutely mad. Oh, here, have a look at yourself. Oh, my God. What happened to me? See? I look just like you gone wrong. Oh! And I can't go see. down to the garage and sell cars looking like this. Oh. How could it have happened? I imagine, Daddy, that you weren't looking very hard and you simply took Mummy's bottle of hair stuff off the shelf instead of your own. Really, Harry? How stupid can you get? Why didn't you read the label before you started splashing stuff all over I you? don't know how it happened. It's terrible strong stuff. You only need a tablespoonful. Oh, yeah. I shouldn't be surprised if it didn't take all your hair off in the end. Hey? Is your scalp burning? You mean I'm going to lose all my hair? Well, I shouldn't be surprised. Peroxide's a very powerful chemical. It's what they put down the lavatory to disinfect the pan, only they give it another name. I'm not a lavatory pan. I don't want to be disinfected. Even diluted like I use it, it makes a good deal of my hair fall out. So goodness knows what's going to happen to you. I don't believe it. I'm surprised it didn't take the whole of the top of your head off. What shall I do? I'd give it a good wash, Dad, if I were you with soap and water. Oh, really? But you'll have to hurry. Well, that changed the colour back. Oh, of course it won't, you twit. Then what do I do? I can't go around looking like this forever. You'll have to have it dyed black. But wash it first or there won't be any there to dye. Right. Right. Get me an appointment with your hairdresser this instant for a hair dyeing job. Oh. Down. Tell them it's an emergency. Stop getting in a state. They'll have to boot someone off their list. I'm ringing them. I'm ringing them. I'm going upstairs to wash it right now. He does do some pretty silly things now and again, doesn't he, Mummy? I'm afraid men are not always quite as clever as they think they are. You learn that when you get a bit older, my girl. There 
we are. Four books due back in two weeks' time. Thank you. Uh, I, I wonder... Uh, may I help you with anything else, madam? I believe you may. Would you be Mrs. Phelps by any chance? That's right. Oh, how do you do? I'm Miss Honey. I teach at Cruncham Hall Primary School. Oh, yes. It's, it's about a new pupil in my class. A girl called Matilda Wormwood. Do you know her? Do I know Matilda? Logs. She's been borrowing books from this library since she was so high. Oh, she told me all about you. An extraordinary little girl. Absolutely. Look, is there anywhere we can go, you know, to talk? Well, we could have a cup of tea in the cafe. It's almost my tea break time. I'll meet you there in five minutes' time, if you like. I'd like that very much. <laughs> By the time Matilda first turned up at the library, she was already reading at the age of four, I ask you. Taught herself, she had, from newspapers and magazines that lay around the house. But she began hankering after books. The only book in the whole of her house was something called Easy Cooking. <laughs> I remember her telling me how she'd asked her dad if he could buy her a book. And he wouldn't. No fear, he said, what's wrong with a telly? Oh, I see. But who brought her to the library? Oh, she brought herself, she did, bless her. But she was only four. I know. But that's dreadful. Well, between you, me and the gatepost, I can tell you that her parents left her alone all afternoon, you know. It worried me something rotten. But you know how difficult it is to interfere. I thought if I stuck my nose in, they wouldn't let her come to the library at all. Of course. She was supposed to entertain herself watching telly. Her big brother went to school, her father went to work at his garage, and her mother went out playing bingo. They showed no interest in Matilda at all, and her such a clever little thing. I remember the day she first walked in. Goodness me, I do as if it were only yesterday. Hello. Hello, dear. My name's Matilda. Well now, Matilda, can I help you? Would it be all right if I sit down and read a book for a while? Of course it would, dear. Please, could you tell me where the children's books are? They're right over there on the lower shelves. Would you like me to help you find a nice one with lots of pictures in it? No, thank you. I'm sure I can manage. From then on, she'd come in every afternoon and spend two hours sitting quietly by herself in a cosy corner, devouring one book after another. Soon she'd read all the children's books and asked me to help her choose a grown-up book. Well, she started off with great expectations, and there was no stopping her. Within a week, she'd finished that one, was on to the next, and within the next six months, she'd read a formidable list of adult books. Every day she'd be sitting there, this tiny, dark-haired person with her feet nowhere near touching the floor, totally absorbed in the wonderful adventures of Jane Austen and J.B. Priestley and Ernest Hemingway. Mr. Hemingway says a lot of things I don't understand, especially about men and women. But I loved it all the same. Well, that's the most important thing, dear. Don't worry about the bits you can't understand. Sit back and allow the words to wash around you like music. Oh, I do. And the way he tells the story. I feel I'm right there on the spot watching it all happen. A fine writer will always make you do that. Now, did you know that the public libraries allow you to borrow books and take them home? Really? Could I do that? Of course. When you've chosen the book you want, bring it to me so I can make a note of it, and it's yours for two weeks. Oh. You can take more than one if you wish. Oh, thank you, Mrs Phelps. Thank you so much. <laughs> You did her a great service, Mrs. Phelps. She's a remarkable little girl. Never come across one like her before. <laughs> Me neither. She arrived at Cruncham Hall only yesterday, and I felt I simply must find out a bit more about her. I was so taken aback by what she could do. Right, children, children. Shh, 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 shh. Settle down now, please. You've all brought your pencils, I hope. Uh, yes, Miss Honey. Oh, yes, yes, Miss Now, Honey. this is your first day at Cruncham Hall, and I'm here to help you learn as much as possible while you're in this class. Don't fidget, Lavender, please. Sorry, Miss Honey. 
Let's start with our multiplication tables. Now, 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 do any of you happen to have learnt the two times table already? Ah, I see one hand go up. Matilda, would you stand up, please, and recite as much of it as you can? Um, yes, Miss Honey. <clears throat> Once two is two, two two is four, three two is six, four two is eight, five two is ten, six two is twelve, seven two is fourteen, eight two is sixty, wow. nine two is eight, ten two is twenty, eleven two is twenty two, twelve two is twenty four, thirteen two is twenty six, fourteen two is twenty eight, fifteen two is thirty, sixteen two is thirty two. Stop! <laughs> How far can you go? Well, I don't know. For quite a long way, I think. Could you tell me what two times twenty eight is? Yes, Miss Honey, it's 56. Wow. What about something much harder, like 2 times 487? Could you tell me that? I think so, yes. Are you sure? I'm fairly sure, Miss Honey. What is it then? 2 times 487. 974. Oh, she's so good. It's not fair. How can she do it and we can't? Don't worry, love. You'll soon catch up. No, you will, yes, yes you will. Come on, don't Come worry on, about it. Mind. Of course, I don't really believe that Lavender will catch up, Mrs. Phelps. Matilda's ability is so astonishing and all self-taught. Oh, yes, her parents haven't helped a scrap. And the really lovely thing about her is that she always speaks quietly and politely without any sign of showing off. Oh, I know. Anyway, I soon discovered that she could multiply any numbers at all. She seems to have a calculator inside her head. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't resist exploring further, so we moved on to spellings. She could spell any word I gave her. I'm not surprised. Then we started on poetry. I gave Matilda a book of humorous verse and asked her to read one aloud. Smoothly, without a pause, and at a nice speed, she began. An epicure dining at crew found a rather large mouse in his stew. Cried the waiter, don't shout and wave it about, or the rest will be wanting one too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was really that was good. Really did that again? That was lovely, Matilda. And do you know what an epicure is? It's someone who's dainty with his eating. That's correct. And do you happen to know what that particular type of poetry is called? It's a limerick. Indeed it is. Now, a witty limerick is very hard to write. I know. I've tried quite a few times, but mine are never any good. Well, I would very much like to hear one. Could you remember one for us, dear? Oh, yes, oh, yes please, 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 tell us please. One. I've actually been trying to make one up about you, Miss Honey. <gasps> about me? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, yeah, tell <gasps> Well, I simply must hear this. But it's using your first name to make things rhyme. I heard another teacher call you Jenny this morning. Oh, Jenny? <laughs> <laughs> well, I insist upon hearing it. Yes, yes, please, please, please. Yes, come on. Yes. Well, all right, it goes like this. The thing we all ask about Jenny is surely there cannot be many young girls in the place with so lovely a face. The answer to that is not any. Yay! <laughs> 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 Oh, Miss Honey, the child's a genius. Surely you can't teach her with the other children. Well, that's exactly what I felt, Mrs. Phelps. So I went to see the headmistress. The headmistress? Yes. Oh, you mean the terrible Miss Trunchbull. I mean the terrible Miss Trunchbull. I've heard that she's completely off our rocker. Barmy is a bed bug, I'm afraid. It's you, Miss Honey. You're looking very flushed and flustered this morning. Have those little stinkers been flicking spitballs at you? No, Headmistress. Well, get on with it. I haven't got all day. Well, there's a girl. Pass me that jug of water, will you? I've been exercising. Works up quite a thirst. Ah. <laughs> well, go on. Go on. There's a girl. In my class. Her name's Matilda Wormwood. Yes. Her father owns Wormwood Motors in the village. An excellent person, Wormwood. 
Sold me a car only yesterday. He did almost new. Only done 10,000 miles. Ha <laughs> ha. Terrific bargain. Told me his daughter was a bad lot, though. Oh, no, quite the contrary. Says she's a real wart of a child. I haven't met the little brat yet, but you'll know about it when I do. Oh, no, that can't be right. Oh, yes, it damn well is right. I'm sure it was her who put a stink bomb under my desk. Oh, no, headmistress, you're mistaken. Don't argue with me! Now, why are you wasting my time? I came here to tell you that Matilda is a genius. A genius? What piffle is this you're talking, madam? I have her father's word for it that the child is a gangster. Her father is wrong, headmistress. Don't be a twerp. You've met the little beast for only half an hour, and her father has known her all her life. Nevertheless, headmistress, it is my opinion that Matilda should be taken out of my form and placed immediately in the top form with the eleven-year-olds. Ha! So you can't handle her, is that it? You want to unload her onto the wretched Miss Plimsoll, which will cause even more chaos? No, no. I can see right through your little plot. Matilda stays where she is, and that's the end of it. Very well, then. It's up to you, headmistress. You're right! You're darn right it's up to me! And don't forget, madam, that we are dealing here with a little viper who put a stink bomb under my desk. She did not. Of course she did. I wish to heavens I was still allowed to use the birch and belt as I did in the good old days. I'd have roasted Matilda's bottom for her so she couldn't sit down for a month. <sighs> I was five and a half when I found myself in Miss Honey's class at Cruncham Hall School. I liked Miss Honey straight away and was really glad to be in school at last. I made friends with a girl called Lavender who was gutsy and adventurous. The two of us would go round together at playtimes and during that first week we started to hear awesome tales about the headmistress Miss Trunchbull. A big girl called Hortensia with a boil on the end of her nose did her best to scare us. Well, Matilda and Lavender. New scum, I suppose. Welcome to Borstal. Borstal? Have you met the Trunchbull yet? No, not yet. We've seen her at prayers, but we haven't met her. You've got a treat coming to you. She hates very small children. Why? She thinks five-year-olds are grubs that haven't yet hatched out. No. Many don't even survive the first year. They get carried out on stretchers screaming. Wow. I've often seen it. On stretchers? Oh, yes. Heard about the chokey, have you? The chokey? The trunchbull has a lock-up cupboard in her private quarters called the chokey. I don't understand. You will. It's very tall and very narrow and you can't sit down or squat in it. You have to stand. And three of the walls are made of cement with bits of broken glass sticking out all over so you can't lean against them. You have to stand more or less at attention all the time when you get locked up in there. It's terrible. Want a crisp? No, thanks. But can't you lean against the door? Yes. Don't be daft. It's got thousands of sharp, spiky nails sticking out of it. Have you ever been in there? My first term, I was in there six times. Six times? Oh. Twice for a whole day. It's torture, I'm telling you. I was off my rocker when she let me out, babbling like an idiot. Yesterday, the Trunchbull caught a boy called Julius Rotwinkle eating licorice all sorts. She picked him up by one arm and flung him clear out of the open classroom window. Did he break any bones? Only a few. But you've got to remember that the Trunchbull once threw the hammer for Britain in the Olympics, so she's very proud of her right arm. The Trunchbull will throw anything around just to keep her arm in, especially children. Oh, no. That's dreadful. Shh, watch out. It's her. It's the Trunchbull. Yep, here she comes. Look at that great big belt around her smock. Evil. And those breeches and those cars like grapefruits. Amanda Thrip! You! Amanda Thrip! Me? Yes! You! Come here! Hold your hats. What's going to happen? That idiot Amanda has let her hair grow even longer during the holes, and her mother has plaited it into pigtails. Silly thing to do. Why silly? If there's one thing the Trunchbull can't stand, it's pigtails. I want those filthy pigtails off before you come back to school tomorrow. Chop them off and throw them in the dustbin. <laughs> Understand? My mummy likes them. She plaits them for me every morning. 
Your mummy's a twit. You look like a rat with tails coming out of its head. My mummy thinks I look lovely, Miss Trunchbull. I don't give a tinker's toot what your mummy thinks. Come here. Give me those pigtails. Ah, ah, oh. Here we go. It's a hammer job. No. <laughs> Just watch it. She's for it. She's about to be thrown. There she goes! Like a rocket. Well thrown, sir. She's going to land in the playing field. She's bouncing off the grass. I do believe she's all right. Look, she's sitting up. Ha! Not bad. Considering I'm not in strict training. <laughs> not bad at all. She's mad. But don't the parents complain? Would yours? I know mine wouldn't. She treats the mothers and fathers just the same as the children, and they're all scared to death of her. <sighs> I'll be seeing you sometime, you two. Bye! school was like being in a cage with a cobra. After the episode with Amanda's pigtails, worse was to come. The very next day in assembly, she made Bruce Bogtrotter eat an enormous chocolate cake in front of the whole school, slice by slice. He'd been accused of stealing a piece of her cake from the kitchens, and this was her revenge. We couldn't believe what we were hearing. Eat another slice. Do as you're told, Bogtrotter. Eat! If I tell you to eat, you will eat. You wanted cake, you stole cake, and now you've got cake. What's more, you're going to eat it. You do not leave this platform, and nobody leaves this hall until you have eaten the entire cake that is sitting there in front of you. Do I make myself clear, Bog Trotter? Do you get my meaning? By some miracle, and with the whole school cheering him on, Bruce managed to eat every crumb, though how he didn't explode, I'll never know. The trunch ball very nearly did. Give me that plate, you worm, you pustule, you foul carbuncle! Ah! <laughs> she brought the empty plate right down on Bruce's head. Luckily, he was so full of cake, he was like a sack full of wet cement, and you couldn't have hurt him with a sledgehammer. With this horror fresh in our minds, Lavender and I discovered that it was soon to be our turn, because Miss Trunchbull was to take our class for afternoon lessons. This is when I found out quite a bit about Lavender, but even more about myself. Now then, children. As I told you yesterday, Miss Trunchbull will be taking you this afternoon. Oh, uh, 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 uh. A few words of warning. The headmistress is very strict about everything. Mm. So make sure you speak only when spoken to. Okay. When she asks you a question, stand up at once before you answer and never argue with her. Oh, yes. That will only make her angry and when the headmistress gets angry, you had better watch out. You can say that again. Lavender. Have you got the headmistress's jug of water and her glass from the kitchen? Yes, Miss Honey, it's here. On the desk, please. Good. Now, the class is all ready for this afternoon, so you may go out to play and make sure you're back here as soon as the bell goes. OK, yes, we will, Miss Honey. Bye, Miss Honey. Bye, Miss Honey. Bye, bye. On your own, Matilda. Where's your friend Lavender, then? I'm not sure. Hope she's not getting up to any mischief, or she'll end up in the chokey. She's probably just helping Miss Honey in the classroom. I hear you've got the trunch ball this afternoon. We have. You'll probably both end up in the chokey. Huh? Oh, look, here comes Lavender with a smirk all over her face. Looks to me as if she's been up to no good at all. See ya. Lavender, where have you been? Sorting out the trunch ball. What do you mean? <laughs> We're in for a good afternoon. Lavender, what have you done? I've put a newt in her water jug. A newt? I smuggled it in in my pencil case this morning. Oh, don't you think that was a brilliant idea? I'm not at all sure that it was. But it's too late now to do anything about it. 
Prepare for possibly the worst afternoon of your life. Children. Good afternoon, Miss Trunchbull. Well, well, well. What a bunch of nauseating little warts you are. It makes me vomit to think that I'm going to have to put up with a load of garbage like you in my school for the next six years. Now, put your hands out in front of you so I can see if they're clean. What's your name? Nigel. Nigel what? Hicks. Nigel Hicks what? Just Nigel Hicks. <sighs> what is my name? Miss Trunchbull. Then use it when you address me. So, let's try again. What's your name? Nigel Hicks, Miss Trunchbull. Your hands are filthy, Nigel Hicks. When did you last wash them? Um, that's rather difficult to remember exactly. It could have been yesterday, or it could have been the day before. I knew it! I knew as soon as I saw you that you were nothing but a piece of filth. What's your father's job, a sewage worker? He's a doctor, and a jolly good one. He says we're also covered with bugs anyway, that a bit of extra dirt never hurts anyone. Well, I'm glad he's not my doctor. And why, might I ask, do you have a baked bean on the front of your shirt? We had baked beans for lunch, miss. Oh, and do you usually put your lunch on the front of your shirt? Is that what this famous doctor of a father has taught you? Huh? Huh? Um, um... You are disgusting. Let's see if you're better at spelling than you are at personal hygiene. Go and stand in the corner on one leg with your face to the wall. But, Miss Trunchbull... Don't argue with me. Now then, spell right. Which one? The one with a pen, you little fool. W-R-I-T-E. Hmm. Miss Honey taught us to spell a very long word yesterday. Oh, and what word was that? Difficulty. You're not supposed to learn long words like that until you're at least eight or nine. And don't try to tell me everybody in the class can spell that word. You are lying to me, Nigel. Test someone. You! What's your name? Lavender. Lavender what? Lavender, Miss Trunchbull. Spell difficulty, Lavender. D-I-F-F-I-C-U-L-T-Y, Miss Trunchbull. Oh! And I suppose Miss Honey wasted the whole of one lesson teaching you to spell that one single word. Oh, no! Miss Honey teaches us lots of words in just three minutes. Oh, and what, may I ask, is this magic method? Miss Honey gives us a little song about each word and we all sing it together. Would you like to hear the song about difficulty? I should be fascinated. Mrs D, Mrs I, Mrs F, F, I, Mrs C, Mrs U, Mrs L, T, Y. Perfectly ridiculous. Cut out the poetry in future, Miss Honey. But it does teach them some of the harder words. Don't argue with me. I shall now test you on multiplication tables to see if Miss Honey has taught you anything at all in that direction. You! Stand up! What's your name? Woopert. Woopert what? Woopert, Mr. Wunchbull. Well, Woopert, what is two sevens? Sixteen. Sixteen, indeed! Eighteen. Two sevens are eighteen. Not sixteen. You ignorant little slug. You witless weed. You empty-headed hamster. You stupid glob of glue. Ouch! Please don't pull my hair. Pull your hair? I'm not just going to pull your hair, you little squat. I'm going to lift you right up by it, like this. Ow! Ow! Two sevens are fourteen. Ow! Two sevens are fourteen. I am not letting you go till you Ow! say it. Miss Trunchbull, please let him down. You're hurting him. Oh, his hair might come out. And well, it might if he doesn't stop wriggling. Keep still, you squirming worm. Say it. Say two sevens are fourteen, and I'll let you go. Two sevens are fourteen? There! Get up and stop snivelling. Let that be a lesson to all of you. That's the way to make them learn, Miss Honey. You've got to hammer it into them. You could do them permanent damage, Miss Trunchbull. Oh, I have. I'm quite sure I have. Miss Trunchbull. <laughs> Shut up, Miss Honey. You're as wet as any of them. When you've been teaching for as long as I have, you'll realise that it's no good at all being kind to children. Read Nicholas Nickleby, Miss Honey, by Mr Dickens. Read about Mr Wackford Squeers, the admirable headmaster of Do the Boys Hall. Ha <laughs> ha, 
He knew how to handle the little brutes, didn't he? He kept their backsides so warm you could have fried eggs and bacon on them. Ah, a fine book. But I don't suppose this bunch of morons we've got here will ever read it, because by the look of them, they are never going to learn to read anything. I've read it. What did you say? I said I've read it, Miss Trunchbull. Read what? Nicholas Nickleby, Miss Trunchbull. You are lying to me, madam. I doubt there is a single child in the entire school who has read that book. And here you are, an unhatched shrimp, sitting in the lowest form there is, trying to tell me a whopping great lie like that. Why? Do you take me for a fool? Well, well, no. Stand up when you speak to me. What is your name? My name is Matilda Wormwood. Miss Trunchbull. In that case, you must be the daughter of that man who owns Wormwood Motors. Yes, Miss Trunchbull. He's a crook. A week ago, he sold me a second-hand car. When I was driving this morning, the entire engine fell out onto the road. The whole thing was filled with sawdust. The man's a thief and a robber. No. I'll have his skin for sausages, you see, if I don't... He's clever at his business. Clever, my foot. Miss Honey tells me that you are meant to be clever, too. <laughs> well, madam, I don't like clever people. They are all crooked. You are most certainly crooked. Before I fell out with your father, he told me some very nasty stories about the way you behaved. But you'd better not try anything in this school, young lady. I shall be keeping a very careful eye on you from now on. Sit down. And keep quiet. Yes, Miss Trunchbull. I don't like small people, and that's a fact. Small people should never be seen by anybody. Children are like insects. They should be got rid of as early as possible. We get rid of insects with fly spray and by hanging up fly paper. I have often thought <laughs> of using some huge strips of sticky paper and hanging them all around the school. You'd all get stuck to them, and that would be the end of it. Wouldn't that be a good idea, Miss Honey? If it's meant to be a joke, Headmistress, I don't think it's a very funny one. You wouldn't, would you? Ha! Huh? Ha! Huh? And it's not meant to be a joke. My idea of a perfect school, Miss Honey, is one that has no children in it at all. Children make me tired. They make me tired. And they make me thirsty. Ha! At least you have had the grace to remember my water jug. Thank you. <coughs> what the place is in that? A creature in my water? I jolly nearly swallowed a creature. Matilda! Matilda! Stand up! Who, me? Stand up, you disgusting little cockroach! I haven't done anything, Miss Trunchbull. I've never seen that slimy thing before. Stand up at once, you filthy little maggot! Right! You are a vile, repulsive, repellent, malicious little no. brute. You are not fit to be in this school. You ought to be behind bars. No. I shall have you drummed out of this establishment in utter disgrace. And then, be quiet! Then I shall make absolutely sure you are sent to a reformatory for delinquent girls for the minimum of 40 years. I didn't do it! Oh, yes, you did! Nobody else could have thought of a trick like that. Your father was right to warn me about you. You, you little maggot! You are finished in this school, young lady! You are finished everywhere! I shall personally see to it that you are put away in a place where not even the crows can land their droppings on you! You will probably never see the light of day again! I'm telling you, I did not do it! I've never seen a creature like that in my life! You! You have put a, a, a crocodile in my drinking water. There is no worse crime in the world against the headmistress. Now sit down and don't say a word. No. Sit down. Sit down at once. But I'm telling you. I am telling you to shut up. If you don't shut up at once and sit down, I shall remove my belt and let you have it with the end that has the buckle. I felt myself getting more and more angry. 
How dare they expel me for something I hadn't done? The newt was still squirming in the tall glass of water, and I glared at the trunchbull, who was sitting behind the teacher's desk, her eyes fixed on the glass. Suddenly, quite slowly, the most extraordinary feeling started to creep over me. The feeling was mostly in my eyes, which were now riveted on the newt in the glass. A kind of electricity seemed to be gathering inside them, a feeling of great strength. My eyeballs were beginning to get hot, as though vast energy was building up. I kept my eyes steadily on the glass, and it was as if millions of tiny little invisible arms with hands on them were shooting out of my eyes towards the glass I was staring at. Tip it, tip it over, I whispered. I saw the glass wobble. Tip it, tip it over. I pushed harder still, willing my eyes to shoot out more power. Then I saw the glass begin to lean backwards, further and further, until it was balancing on just one edge of its base. It teetered for a few seconds before finally toppling over and falling with a sharp tinkle on the desk. The trunchbull, with a roar, swiped it and sent it flying across the classroom. Bah! Who did it? Come on, hold up. Step forward, you won't escape this time. Who is responsible for this filthy job? Who pushed over this glass? Matilda? It was you! I know it was you! Speak up, you clotted carbuncle! Admit that you did it! I haven't moved away from my desk since the lesson began, Miss Trunchbull. She, she didn't, didn't move. move. The children didn't move. Nobody moved. It's been here all the time. You must have knocked it over yourself. I most certainly did not knock it over myself. How dare you suggest a thing like that? Speak up, Miss Honey. You must have seen everything. Who knocked over my glass? None of the children did, Miss Trunchbull. I can vouch for it. Nobody has moved from his or her desk all the time you've been here, except for Nigel, and he hasn't moved from his corner. Ha! I am fed up with you, you, you useless bunch of midgets! I refuse to waste any more of my precious time in here! I think we've had enough school for one day, don't you? Oh, yes. The class is dismissed. Oh, yes. You may yes. all go out into the playground and wait for your parents to come and take you home. Yes, Miss yes. Honey. Miss Honey. See you tomorrow, Miss Honey. Goodbye, Miss Honey. Goodbye, Lavender. Well, Matilda, aren't you going outside with the others? Please, may I talk to you for a moment? Of course. What is it? Miss Trunchbull isn't going to expel me, is she? Oh, no. Because it wasn't me who put that creature in her jug of water. I promise it wasn't. I know it wasn't. The headmistress just got a little overexcited, that's all. I know. Miss Honey? Yes? Something very peculiar has happened to me, Miss Honey. Go on. I'm listening. You saw the glass of water spilling all over Miss Trunchbull, didn't you? I did indeed. Well... It was me, Miss Honey. But, Matilda, you never touched it. You never went near it. I don't quite follow you. I got so angry at being accused of something I hadn't done that I made it happen. You made what happen? I made the glass tip over. I did it with my eyes. I was staring at it and wishing it to tip over, and then my eyes went all hot and funny, and some sort of power came out of them, and the glass just toppled over. You mean... You were sitting where you are now, and you told the glass to topple over, and it did? Something like that, yes. If you did that, then it is just about the greatest miracle a person has ever performed since the time of Jesus. I did it, Miss Honey. Could you do it again? I don't know. I might be able to. Here we are. Here's the glass. Should I put water in it? I don't think it matters. Very well, then. Go ahead and tip it over. It may take some time. Take all the time you want. I'm in no hurry. Gracious me, Matilda. Are you all right? You've gone completely white, dear. Your eyes, they're blazing. Oh, my. Oh, do be careful. Matilda. Matilda! Are you... Are you all right, dear? I'm quite all right, Miss Honey, so don't be alarmed. You seemed so far away. Oh, I was. I was flying past the stars on silver wings. It was wonderful. I don't believe it. It's not possible. Oh, Matilda, 
I think we both need time to understand this. I tell you what, would you like to come back and have tea at my cottage? Oh, I'd love to. Good. Gather up your things and I'll meet you outside in a couple of minutes. You, you won't tell anyone, will you, Miss Honey? I wouldn't dream of it. Miss Honey lived in a tiny red brick cottage down a narrow lane. I remember thinking that it looked more like a doll's house than a human dwelling. It was like an illustration from a children's story. There was a little well in the garden and the front door was covered with flaky green paint. There was no keyhole. Miss Honey just lifted the latch, opened the door and in we went. There now, you can come through to the kitchen and help me make the tea. First of all, we'll need to get some water from the well in the garden. Oh, OK. Then I'll light the primer stove. Here, take the bucket. Oh, yes. Now, what we do is hook the bucket onto the end of this rope here, turn the handle, and that lowers the bucket down into the well. Oh, I see. That's it. Then turn the handle the other way. That's right. And here it is. Is this enough? Mm, just about. I don't suppose you've ever done that before, have you? Never. Now, let's go and light the primer stove. How do you get enough water for your bath? Oh, I don't take a bath. I get a bucket full of water and I heat it on this little stove and I strip and wash myself all over. Really? Of course. Every poor person in England used to wash that way until not so very long ago. Are you poor, Miss Honey? Yes, very. It's a good little stove, isn't it? Yes. Now then, bread and margarine. I'm afraid I don't have any sugar. Oh, that's all right. Let's have it in the sitting room. OK. Come on, through here. Pull up a box to sit on. Oh. I'm sorry there aren't any chairs. That's all right. Sit down, my dear, sit down. Now then, both slices of bread are for you. I never eat anything when I get home. I have a good old tuck-in at the school lunch and that keeps me going until the next morning. Miss Honey, do they pay you very badly at our school? Not too badly. I get about the same as the others. But it must still be very little if you're so dreadfully poor. Do all the teachers live like this with no furniture and no kitchen stove and no bathroom? No, they don't. I just happen to be the exception. I expect you just happen to like living in a very simple way. It must make house cleaning an awful lot easier. And I suppose if you don't have a fridge, you don't have to go out and buy all sorts of junky things like eggs and mayonnaise and ice cream to fill it up with. I'm sorry, Miss Honey. I shouldn't have asked you those questions. <laughs> Why shouldn't you ask? You're much too bright not to have wondered. Perhaps I even wanted you to ask. Maybe that's why I invited you here after all. I'm really glad you did invite me. Up to now, I found it impossible to talk to anyone about my problems. But now, all of a sudden, I have a sort of desperate wish to tell everything to somebody. I know you're only a tiny little girl, but there is some kind of magic in you somewhere. I've seen it with my own eyes. May I tell you a story, Matilda? You can tell me anything. I'm 23 years old, and when I was born, my father was a doctor in this village. Magnus, his name was. Magnus? That's right. What a lovely name. And he was a lovely man, too. I loved him very much. We had a nice old house. It's tucked away in the woods behind the hills. I was born there. And then came the first tragedy. My mother died when I was two. My father invited my mother's unmarried sister, my Aunt Agatha, to come and live with us, to help him to run the house and to look after me. How old was the aunt when she moved in? Not very old. I should say about thirty. But I hated her right from the start. Oh, no. Mm, I missed my mother terribly. And the Aunt Agatha was not a kind person. My father didn't know that because he was hardly ever around. But when he did put in an appearance... The aunt behaved differently. Go on, please. Well, then came the second tragedy. When I was five, my father died very suddenly. One day he was there and the next day he was gone. My aunt became my legal guardian. How awful. And in some way or another, she became the actual owner of the house. How did your father die? Nobody knew exactly. You see, no one could believe that he would ever have done it. Done what? killed himself. Did he? That's what it looked like, but who knows? I know what you're thinking. 
You're thinking that the aunt killed him and made it look as though he'd done it himself. Oh, one must never think things like that, Matilda, without any proof. What happened when you were left alone with the aunt? Was she nice to you? Nice? She was a demon. As soon as my father was out of the way, she became a holy terror. What did she do to you? I don't want to talk about it. It's too horrible. But in the end, I became so frightened of her that I used to start shaking when she came into the room. Oh, Miss Honey, didn't you go to school? Yes. I went to the same school you're going to now. But I became so dominated by this monster of an aunt that when she gave me an order, no matter what it was, I obeyed it instantly. How did you get to be a teacher? Ah, well, I was allowed to go to the teacher's training college so long as I came straight home again every afternoon to do the washing and ironing and to clean the house and cook the supper. But how did you get away? How did you get this house? Well, when I got my teacher's job, the aunt told me that I owed her a lot of money because she'd been feeding me for years and buying me shoes and clothes. So I had to start paying her back. I was just a slave to her. Then one day, while I was out walking... I came across this cottage. I found out that it was owned by a farmer, and he agreed to let me rent it, though he thought I was mad, since it has no conveniences, no running water, no nothing. So suddenly you had a house all of your own? Mm, that's right. <gasps> but how did you pluck up the courage to tell Aunt Agatha? That was tough. One night, after I had cooked her supper... I went upstairs and packed the few things I possessed in a cardboard box and came downstairs and announced I was leaving. I've rented a house, I said. Well done, you. So you are free at last. Mm. I think you're so brave, Miss Honey. Not really, Matilda. I like it. It's better this way. This awful aunt, I suppose she's still living in your lovely old house. Very much so. She's only about 50. She'll be around for a long time yet. But do you think your father really meant her to have it? I'm quite sure he didn't. But my father's will was never found. It looks as though somebody destroyed it. No prizes for guessing who. No prizes. But if there's no will, Miss Honey, then surely the house goes automatically to you. You are the next of kin. I know, Matilda. But my aunt produced a piece of paper, supposedly written by my father, saying that he leaves the house to her in return for her kindness... I'm certain it's a forgery, but no one can prove it. Oh, couldn't you try? Couldn't you hire a good lawyer and try? I don't have the money to do that. And you must understand that my Aunt Agatha is a much respected figure in the community. Oh. She has a lot of influence. But where is the house? It's the Red House, Matilda. Down the lane in the village. <gasps> the Red House? But we know who lives in that house. We do. So your Aunt Agatha, your Aunt Agatha is, is... Miss Trunchbull. Miss Trunchbull? Magnus! I had the name of Miss Honey's father spinning around in my brain when I went home that evening. Soon a plan was forming in my head. For the next week, every evening after school, I shut myself in my bedroom and practised my newfound art of moving things. I practised with one of my father's cigars. It demanded a great deal of patience and concentration. Gradually, I discovered that I could pull and push the cigar just by using my eyes. It was vital that I learned how to lift it. After six days and a lot of practice, I managed to lift the cigar and hold it in the air for at least a minute. And six days later, I found that I was able to make the cigar do exactly what I wanted. All I had to do now was to put the plan into action. Well, children, it's Thursday again, and Miss Trunchbull will be here in a few minutes. Oh, no, no, please, please, no, please, no, no, please, no, 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 now, I'm aware that one or two of you didn't particularly enjoy the last occasion when the headmistress took the class, so let's all try to be especially careful and clever today. Okay. She'll be testing you on your three times table. That's what you're supposed to have learnt this week. She's coming. Don't be cheeky, remember. Here she comes. I am.
am glad to see that there are no slimy creatures in my drinking water this time. If there had been, then something exceptionally unpleasant would have happened to every single member of this class. Right! The three times table. Let's see how well Miss Honey has taught you your three times table. You! Who, who me? Yes, you! Stand up. What's your name? Lavender, Miss Trunchbull. Ah, yes! Lavender! Ha! I remember. Recite the three times table backwards. But, but I haven't learned it backwards. Ah, there you are! She taught you nothing! Ha! Ha! Very well. Answer me this. I have seven apples, seven oranges and seven bananas. How many pieces of fruit do I have altogether? Hurry up! Get on with it! Give me the answer! That's adding up. You blithering idiot! You festering gumboil! You flea-bitten fungus! That is the three times table. Three separate lots of fruit, and each lot has seven pieces. Three sevens are twenty-one. It's called multiplication, you moth-eaten maggot. Come here. Ow! Ow! Please don't pull my hair. The chalk! The chalk! Look at the chalk! It's moving on its own over the blackboard. What are you saying, you stupid boy? It's writing something. The chalk is writing something. Agatha. Wow, what's it writing? What's it writing? What is it? It's written Agatha. <gasps> what the blazes is this? Who's doing this? Who's writing it? Agatha, this is Magnus. This is Magnus. What? <laughs> what are you doing? Who's doing this? This is Magnus. <gasps> Magnus? No, no, it can't be. Yes, it can't be Magnus. Agatha. It says Agatha again. That's, that's you, isn't it, Miss Trunchbull? Quiet, boy. <laughs> What on earth is going? Give my Jenny back her house. What? The house? <laughs> Give my Jenny her wages. Give my Jenny the house. Then get out of here. If you don't, I'll come and get you. I will come and get you like you got me. I am watching you, Agatha. Miss Trunchbull is out down. cold. Miss Trunchbull is on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. It took five teachers, Mr Trilby the deputy headmaster and the matron to lift the trunchbull and carry her to the sick room. When she came out of her faint, she marched out of the school building tight-lipped and white in the face. We never saw her again, she just vanished. Magnus's will mysteriously turned up at a solicitor's firm and Miss Honey moved back into the red house where she belonged. This is a beautiful garden, Miss Honey. I know. I'm very lucky. Oh, but you deserve it. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you, Matilda, would I? It was a good trick with the chalk, <laughs> wasn't it? <laughs> it certainly was. Piece of chocolate cake? Yes, please. It's quite a different tea from the one I offered you in the cottage, isn't it? I like that just as much, but I'm glad you're not poor anymore. No, I'm not poor. I miss not having you as my teacher. I miss not having you in my class, Matilda. But you're so much better off in Miss Plimsoll's class. I know. I do like it. And you know you can come here to tea every day if you like. Thanks, Miss Honey. Miss Honey? Yes? This morning, just for fun, I tried to push something over with my eyes, and I couldn't do it. Nothing moved. The power had gone. I think I've lost it completely. Hmm. Well, I've been expecting something like that to happen. But why? Because... When you were in my class, you had nothing to make you struggle. There was tremendous energy bottled up in your brain with nowhere to go. And somehow or other, you were able to shoot that energy out through your eyes and make objects move. 
But now you're in the top form, competing against children more than twice your age, and all that mental energy is used up in class. I'm glad it's happened. I wouldn't want to go through life as a miracle worker. <laughs> <laughs> You've done enough. I can still hardly believe you made all this happen for me. Did you know that the heart of a mouse beats at the rate of 650 times a minute? No. And that means it goes so fast that you can't even hear the separate beats. <gasps> a hedgehog's heart isn't quite as fast as a mouse's. Harry, pass that suitcase. All right, Quick. all right. Oh, Michael, have you got everything you want? Yeah. You'll back up then and I'll start loading up the oh. car. I'm packing as fast as I can. I'm not a fairy. What's going on? What are you all doing? We're leaving for the airport in half an hour, so you better get packed. Packed? Get a move on, go. Where are we off to? Spain. Oh. It's a better climate than this lousy country. Spain? I don't want to go to Spain. Just oh. do as you are told. For God's sake, stop arguing, Matilda. But I love my school, Daddy. I don't want to leave my school. Shut oh, up. Goodness. We're leaving in 30 minutes. I'm not missing that plane. When are we coming back? We aren't. Now beat it. I'm busy. Oh, no, no. Just where do you think you're going? To Miss Honey's. To the Red House. I've got to tell her. Oh, no, you have not. I have. Really? Wretched child? Well, just you make sure you're back in 20 minutes, young lady. Here. I already stuffed these socks in that bag. Oh, Michael! God. Michael! Come down here and help your father! They've all got mad, Miss Honey. Ooh. They're filling their suitcases and they're leaving for Spain in half an hour. Oh, Please don't make me go. Don't make me! <laughs> Calm down, Matilda. You mean your parents are taking you on a holiday? No! They're going forever. What? Daddy said we're never coming back. Oh, dear. I can't go, Miss Honey. I won't leave you. I won't. I'm not surprised they're having to go. Why? Why aren't you surprised? Please tell me, please. Because your father is in with a bunch of crooks. <gasps> My guess is that he is the receiver of stolen cars from all over the country. No! He's in it deep. You mean the police are after him? I expect so. I don't want to go with them. I won't go. Oh, Matilda, I'm afraid you must. I want to live here with you. Oh. Please let me live here with you. You can't leave your parents just because you want to. They have a right to take you with them. But what if they agreed? What if they said yes? Oh, if they said yes, then that would be heaven. Do you really mean that? Of course I mean it. Come on, Miss Honey. Come with me. Come with me and ask them if I can stay with you. All right. Quick. Shove that one in the boot, son. Chop, chop, or we'll miss the plane. Harry! Harry, there's another case in here. Keep your hair on. I can't be in two places at once. Oh, Matilda! You're back, you little beast. Daddy! Daddy! I don't want to go with you. You what? This is Miss Honey. Oh. She says that I can stay with her, but only if you say yes. Please say yes. Please, please say yes. What's going on? The child wants to stay with his teacher woman. I'd love to have Matilda. I look after her, Mr Wormwood, and I'd pay for everything. I should hope you blooming well would. Give me that case, Michael. It was Matilda's idea. I won't agree to take her without your full and willing consent. And the other one, the Raxa. Come on, boy, we haven't got all day. Please, Daddy. Please, Mummy. Let me stay. Oh, why don't we let her stay if that's what she wants, Harry? There'll be one less to look after. Hurry up, get in the car. Come on, Michael, get in! I've got a plane to catch and I can't waste no more time. If she wants to stay, let her stay. <laughs> it's fine by me. <laughs> It's wonderful. Oh, Miss Honey, it means I can stay. You can. It'll be just you and me. They've gone, and I can stay with you forever. Forever, Matilda. Forever. Matilda leapt into Miss Honey's arms and hugged her. And Miss Honey hugged her back. Neither of them said a word as they watched the big black car tearing round the corner at the end of the road and disappearing forever into the distance.